looking back at 20 years uh, of the CNN effect. Uh, welcome here to, to PREO, all of you. Uh, my name is Maria Gabrielson Jambert, and I'm a member of the Media Research Group. And I also would like to mention that this seminar is organized as part of a strategic initiative here at PREO to uh, further develop the field of media and conflict studies. So that's also the reason for why we are very happy to have all of you here to, to engage in this debate uh, with us. Uh, I'm also very happy to welcome our distinguished guests from abroad. Uh, thank you for, for coming all the way here to, to Oslo. Uh, Piers Robinson is a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester and has worked uh, for many years on uh, the concept of the CNN effect, as so was part of your early works, uh, and uh, your book uh, from 2002, uh, The CNN Effect, The Myth of News, Foreign Policy, and Intervention, is uh, one of the most cited works um, uh, on this topic. And more recently, uh, you have been working on um, the British news media coverage of the Iraq uh, intervention. And then uh, we also welcome uh, Professor Eitan Gilboa from the Bar Ilan uh, University in Israel. Um, he's the director of the School of Communication uh, and the Center for International Communication uh, at the, the Bar Ilan University, and has worked uh, for many years as well and published extensively on the, the topics of media and conflict and the role of the US in the Middle East. And uh, in line with these uh, fields of uh, expertise, I'm also very happy to welcome Tina Ustalfiginska from the Department of Media and Communication at the University of Oslo. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow there and has worked on the role of uh, Al Jazeera and especially Al, Al Jazeera English as a new uh, media actor uh, on, the, on the global media scene. Uh, so we very much look forward to, to all of your uh, interventions. Um, and uh, it's uh, now time to leave the floor, uh, give the word to uh, our chair for the day, who will lead us through this debate and uh, who um, is also a real media person, uh, foreign policy editor uh, from Daxavisen, Ivar uh, Iversen. Uh, and it will also be very interesting to have his fresh insight from how things work in uh, in a daily newspaper. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me on a very interesting seminar for me as a media person also. Um, before I let you have the floor, I'll just give uh, three quick examples uh, to frame this discussion uh, on how it looks from uh, from my perspective. Um, I've worked in Dark Service newspaper here in Oslo for 12 years. It's now most of the time in foreign news. Um, but back in 91, and uh, during the first Gulf War, I was just uh, 13 years old. Uh, but I remember still very well sitting home in my living room with my parents watching uh, Peter Arnett uh, showing us the consequences of the so-called smart bombs on CNN, on live TV. Uh, no such things as the internet, of course, at the time. So um, CNN was the, was the only source on the spot uh, being able to show us what was happening, uh, which then led to the term the CNN effect. Um, then going on to 2003, I was working in, in the newspaper with the second war in Iraq. Um, we were still watching CNN. <laughs> there was such a thing as the internet, uh, but no web TV, so we, we were still dependent on our um, uh, TV channels to, to have a look at the inside. We did, didn't have any correspondence ourselves. Um, but I remember we, we had to actually change the subscription on our TV channels in um, in Daxavisen because we just had CNN and we didn't really trust them as they were all <laughs> embedded with the with the troops and they um, sort of gave the American perspective so we we added BBC on our list to um, I'm not sure if it really helped us and maybe Pierce would know more about that but it gave us a more a sense of plura plurality at least um, and then finally um, 2011 uh, last year the Arab Spring uh, we were still we did have correspondent in Egypt, but we were still also sitting at the home desk, the for foreign news desk in Oslo, uh, watching the events. Uh, no longer watching CNN, and neither BBC, but Al Jazeera. Um, and not even Al Jazeera as the primary source of, of news. Uh, most of the time we were looking at our uh, computer screens, uh, sifting through endless streams of Twitter uh, tweets, uh, Facebook posts, and, 
and blog posts trying to make sense of what was happening uh, real time. Um, and I remember quite often I thought <laughs> to myself that I kind of missed CNN and BBC as being the, um, the main sources of news, as it was quite hard to really make sense of all this. Which tweets should we trust? Which blogs? Uh, which Facebook posts? What was really happening? What was important? What was not? Uh, how to make sense of this endless stream of, um, of news. So that tells a bit about how much this has changed in just um, 20 years, um, both in the media and also in, um, in the field of policy, what is the re CNN effect is uh, really about. So what we'll do now is that you have um, 15, 20 minutes each to make your presentation and um, set the discussion, and then I'll um, lead us through um, remarks and questions and answers after that, and we'll finish by 11 o'clock. So, Pierce Robinson, your first floor is yours. Uh, I'll start by uh, thanking Murray and everyone for inviting me here today. Uh, it's, it's very exciting to be involved in the project that's being developed here in terms of researching questions of media state dynamics in the contemporary media environment. Um, some people might be aware, I, I started looking at debates surrounding the CNN effect quite some time ago, back in the 1990s, when I was doing my PhD. Um, and what, what I'll try and do probably over the next 10, 15 minutes, I, I thought I'd spend a few minutes just recapping some of the issues which surfaced uh, in relation to that debate. Um, and then lead into talking about sort of really how much has changed since then in terms of the media environment, trying to flag up what I think are some of the major developments. Um, and then lead into sort of perhaps the kind of things that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of days in terms of what we really need to try and find out about what's going on at the moment, what we think the major issues are, and so on, in relation to the, this question of media representation of conflict and what it means for responses, and so on, from the international community. That's what I'll do, and, and I'll keep my time. It, it sounds going to speak slightly longer than I am, but I'll try and keep this to um, 15 minutes. Um, 1990s, I mean, it's very easy, I think, to combine together a lot of different types of conflict and talk about the media and so on. So we can talk about World War I and so on and so forth, the role of the media, CNN, etc. Um, really, I think, to a very large extent, the, the big debate in the 1990s, the one which really sort of drew the attention of not just communication scholars, but also IR scholars and political scientists, was the issue of the way in which media was representing humanitarian crises and the kind of potential impact that was having on policy responses to those crises. And, and I guess, sort of, you know, without revisiting each of the cases, uh, the intervention in northern Iraq in 1991 to create Kurdish safe havens, for example, intervention in Somalia in 1992 to 93, intervention in Bosnia, and then intervention in Kosovo were all seen to varying degrees, and we have plenty of academic controversy, were all seen in varying degrees as examples of crises around the world where the media had represented, given a voice to suffering people in some shape or form, and that that had filtered through to actual concrete policy responses. And I think you know the reason why there was such a big debate in the 1990s over the CNN effect was, of course, decided that media was actually propelling responses to these crises, which was generating what we ha now have through the responsibility to protect, but helping to generate a fledgling norm of, of humanitarian intervention. And of course, I'm sure all of you are aware this was seen as a very significant departure in the international system in terms of concepts of state sovereignty and so on being able to be overturned. Uh, in pursuit of defense of human rights. And this all melded together already in the 1990s, this idea of, of the media helping to push and propel these interventions of a new norm developing in the international system surrounding humanitarian intervention. Um, and needless to say, and, and I think this sort of gets to, to a normative issue here, this was seen as in a tremendously positive light, I think, for many of the humanitarian circles in terms of the potential power of the media to facilitate both representation of suffering people and also to facilitate responses from the international community. Talk and hopes about global cosmopolitanism, shared norms and so on and so forth. All of this was really, I think, captures what was at the heart of the kind of enthusiasm, which I think probably most people would agree to say that enthusiasm is still there today in, in the current uh, new media environment, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. 
But at the heart of this was this desire, hope that in some ways media, news media, forms of representation were finding ways of giving a voice to suffering people and getting something done and so on in terms of crises such as in Bosnia, Kosovo and Somalia. Again, without spending too long sort of uh, running through the details of the research findings, a lot of research was done on this. They did a lot of work. I did quite a lot of work and, and many other scholars uh, carried out projects in the 1990s, early uh, new millennium looking at the CNN effect. And, and I guess sort of maybe just to, to, to sort of maybe summarize what we found, I mean, there, there was a, a very mixed picture, I think, emerging. I think at the beginning of the 1990s, there was a very straightforward kind of argument being made about media representation of crisis, humanitarian intervention following, and so on. And I think uh, varying degrees of skepticism, would be a polite way of putting it, evolved throughout the 1990s. I think, in a sense, a very mixed picture emerged. I, I think there was a, a clear criticism coming up that some of the media pressure was generating superficial and short-term responses to humanitarian crises. And, and that was something which was, I, I think uh, Peter Jacobson spoke about in terms of you know, what the media tends to do is it takes attention of the international community away from conflict prevention, away from peace building, and focuses attention on firefighting crises which have developed and so on. And, you know, for many, this is a, a sort of a, a, not a particularly effective way of trying to sort of uh, reduce levels of conflict and so on. I think also in terms of what the media was actually doing, again, varying sort of degrees of skepticism. Some were arguing that media coverage was triggering particular forms of intervention. And I think sort of as much as Kosovo might be seen in terms of the media helping to trigger uh, that intervention, of course, the criticism of the Kosovo operation in 1999 was that it was very much... Uh, generated by air power, there was no troops on the ground and so on, and as some people pointed out, this was a very stand offish type of intervention and so on. So, you know, some of the evidence emerging that whilst the media seemed to have this power to push responses and so on, these responses were sort of falling short of, of humanitarian ideals and so on. Um, that's quite aside from all the, as we know, the controversy surrounding Kosovo um, by the end of the 1990s in terms of what was really going on. Um, and I guess the whole entire CNN effect debate and question of media also sort of, to an extent, was kept in check, I think, by the end of the 1990s with a more general critique sort of emerging about the liberal peace and about sort of very Western top-down approaches to conflict resolution and so on. Um, and up in the 1990s, if that's what was going on and that's what we found, Obviously, and this, this I think is something which is sort of driving the kind of interests, Jason and Maria, Itan and I, and driving the interest of current research which is emerging into questions of media and media power, is of course, the last 10 years things have changed dramatically in terms of the media environment. Personally, I hate this phrase, but lots of people are using it, new media environment, new media ecology, and so on, all these arguments which have sort of developed in order to try and uh, capture or attempt to capture the sense of what has emerged in the last 10 years. Um, I could spend a long time talking about this, but I won't. I mean, for one thing, we talk about the CNN effect, and I guess it's always important to keep in mind that the CNN effect was really just shorthand for a more general argument about the impact of media, mainstream media, on policy processes and so on. We don't just have CNN anymore, anyway. We have Al Jazeera, we have BBC World, we have a variety of so-called global media providers and so on, which has clearly changed, um, uh, was ended the monopoly of CNN in terms of um, global media coverage. We have more global media. Uh, and ones which are not necessarily located sort of in the Western sphere. In a sense, at the national level, in terms of newspapers and in terms of news that people are getting, and certainly in the UK and certainly to an extent in the US, you have a kind of increasingly parochial nature of news coverage, a tendency to focus on domestic issues. And linked with this is a very interesting development in terms of narrow casting news. And this is very much driven by the kind of digital environment we have now. So just to give you a quick example, BBC, we still have traditional BBC evening <coughs> news and so on, but through the digital channels, there's also a specific channel dedicated to world coverage. Okay? And what that tends, to, the effect that has tended to have in terms of mainstream BBC news output is it's tended to move away from covering international issues and leave that to the specialist channel and so on. And, and you've got this kind of narrow casting, A, potential because of digital and so on, um, but also, I think, because of the economics of the industry and so on, which is um, 
creating a very different context in terms of how people might or might not become aware of crises and, and issues around the world. Infotainment, don't want to spend too long on this one, but the, the sort of argument about the 24-hour news coverage and the, the, the drive for drama and immediacy and so on, generating a kind of infotainment orientation in the news. So the decline perhaps in quality hard news and a rise in, in, in more dramatic human-centered news coverage. Again, f raising issues about, I guess, about quality and depth of reporting and so on. Moving away from sort of news media and all of these developments, which in a sense are sort of a, an evolution of traditional kind of mainstream news that, that we all had, we of course have social media. We have Twitter, Facebook, mobile phones, and so on. And the convergence of all of that technology and all mainstream news broadcasters around the internet and so on. And of course, this is why people talk about now the new media ecology, the new media environment, and this idea of the kind of levels of interconnection. <coughs> Arguments about a degree of plurality from some quarters about what we're getting now with the internet. And also this sense in which, you know, in a way, this free flow of information which is facilitated <coughs> through the internet, we really are in an environment where an event on the ground uh, in a very distant part of the world can very rapidly become an international issue and so on and, and start to influence and shape responses and so on. Um, and numerous sort of examples, uh, and I'm sure we'll, some people will, will talk of them uh, today, but numerous examples of, of, of this kind of interconnectivity that we appear to have with the new media environment. Um, this obviously for academics, we, you know, it used to be the good old days when we could sit down and watch do some analysis on the evening news and so on, get a sense of, well, most people are getting to see that news report and so on, and we can, policymakers also thinking, well, this is the kind of sort of coverage which is coming back from this crisis and so on. Those are the sort of good old days of sort of consistency and, and, and so on, and some kind of firm sense of who the audience was and, and, and what people were watching, what information they were consuming. Obviously, with the internet and with new media environment, we have, we have a very different uh, ball game, I think. This leads to the last five minutes, um, talking about, well, okay, given that, we have this debate from the 1990s, we have this dramatically different media environment at this point in time. I'll flag up a, a word of doubt, they're dramatically different in some ways, but in other ways, relatively familiar, if you think of the extent to which traditional media have sort of adopted an online presence and so on. And, and a lot of research which does clearly show that people do tend to defer to the traditional media which they know and trust when they go onto the internet and so on. So there's change and continuity there and so on, but obviously uh, the time isn't right for new research into the relationship between media and policy, given all of these changes which have happened. Um, and I'm sort of conveniently sidestepping the other sort of big things which have been happening in the last 10, 15 years in relation to obviously the war on terror, um, uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, which have clearly dominated um, Western, uh, response, uh, Western foreign policy right, for most of the decade. Leaving those aside, let's talk about what we perhaps need to, or what we need to think about and what, we, what questions remain very unclear or unanswered at this point in time. I'd say one thing is that, you know, I, I started with the CNN effect debate in the 1990s, and those aspirations and those hopes of the media being able to do good, I think those aspirations remain there today, and I think you can see that in terms of the sort of work which is being done here and so on, in terms of research proposals, and also the work being done in other uh, quarters of the academy throughout the West. Is there remains this belief that something good can come of the media and, and so on, and the role of journalists, etc. But I think that's still very much there. I think I, and I'm going to run through three points, and, and the first point is, is, a, is something which we're going to be talking about in the project, I think, and one of my colleagues, Roger McGinty from Manchester, who's going to be involved and very interested in this, but really is, is to start to take whatever debate we're having about the CNN effect in terms of media representation of a crisis, linking back to the foreign policy of America or the United Kingdom or, or whatever country you were looking at, and really start to understand how media operates in, within conflict zones and so on, and how um, various actors within conflict zones use or abuse media and so on, how that process might then feed up into uh, global media and into international responses and so on, but really just trying to get an understanding of what's going on at the local level within conflict zones in relation to the media and so on. I think Laurie Friedman did a very interesting article on uh, 
2000 and reviewed international studies on Kosovo and on sort of the promotion of, of a sense of victimhood and so on from the Kosovo Albanians through CNN and the global media. But that idea that sort of we have actors on the ground in these conflicts who are clearly knowledgeable about the media and clearly seeking ways to, to, to use the media and so on. And that's an area which is important to explore, I think, in terms of research. And another area, and this gets you know, dreadfully complex and so on, I think, in research terms, but it's something which the CNN effect literature tended to fail to do, is to have a really proper engagement with the question of the international community and the international organizations involved in responses. A lot of research today very much focuses, as Itan, um, I'm sure, um, agrees, they, they focus on, on a national level, looking at the interactions between media, public opinion, and foreign policy decisions, and was failing to capture what was going on in the realm of the United Nations and so on. And capturing or being able to start to analyze that level is, is I think, an important objective for research at this point in time. And I think this brings us to the biggest, well, for me anyway, the, the biggest question that we have confronting us at this point in time is that we're obviously in an era where there is, on the one hand, a lot of optimism, I think, about the internet and about the kind of transparency which it appears to create about the world. And I think, in some ways, that optimism is warranted. At the same time, there's also a number of possibilities about what's going on at the moment in terms of both the awareness of public's crises around the world and also the ability for journalists and the ability for media organizations to play a role in terms of actually facilitating action. And on the one hand, you can look at this technology and you can look at the speed with which information circulates the globe and say, well, clearly, this is changing the game. This is perhaps pluralizing power, this is giving an opportunity to the previously voiceless and so on and so forth to really uh, start to influence and so on and, and encourage responses. There's another argument, and I think one has to really confront it and, and think very honestly about it, and this links back to a point I made about the BBC and this narrow casting tendency, is that we also have a situation where we have a tremendously fragmented public sphere at the national level and fragmented global public sphere. In a sense, questions about how big an audience one ever has in relation to any particular conflict and how long that audience really persists are very unclear at this point in time. There is a possibility that we are moving into a period where we have a fragmentation of information, um, in a sense, a, potentially a disempowerment of the ability to facilitate collective action. And that's also one extreme, but that's the other extreme from the other side of the argument that sort of we have a fundamentally empowering environment. And I think probably the truth lies somewhere in the middle, that clearly there are tendencies or there are potentialities in a new media environment for positive humanitarian responses to be encouraged and so on and so forth. But there's also a real potential, and if you just start to look at the kind of audience you have, say, in Western countries for foreign news and the number of people who are actually getting information, there's a real question mark about how much the kind of political will and pressure you might need from publics to, to respond to crises and so on, whether you're really getting that in the media environment which is emerging at this point in time. And this poses really difficult and, and troubling questions, I think, for journalists, troubling questions for people who are interested in notions of public sphere and democracy and representation and so on. Um, and, and I think at this point it's really very unclear, and this is why this is such an interesting area, an important area to start to really uh, study, to, to get a handle on, on, on how much this technology is ultimately empowering and so on, and how much it's actually disabling responses and so on. Um, I've gone to 18 minutes now, so I'd stick to 15. So that's all I have to say for now. Um, <coughs> I'll pass over to Teddy's card. I need to stand, if you excuse me. Um, I have a much longer presentation. Uh, but uh, I will focus today on just major issues. Uh, I will expand on what you heard from uh, Piers. I would like to start from his last point. We were told that media pluralism is a good thing because people will be able to shop uh, among various sources of information. But media pluralism has a negative aspect as well because audiences select a medium according to their ideological and political beliefs and they don't get to see other points of view. Take the US for example, you have people watching just Fox News and the left is watching just MSNBC. So 
you get just reinforcement of what you uh, believe in. So we need to, to investigate uh, media pluralism and audiences, how the two interact. Um, where's, my, uh, where's my presentation? I'm a theorist of international communication, and for me the CNN effect is part of major work I have done in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so about media and international conflict, as well as media and conflict resolution. So this is, this is the title of uh, my presentation. So I'm looking at historical and theoretical perspectives of, of the CNN effect. And, um, and again, I, I will expand on some of the points that Pierre has, uh, he has done an excellent job, as usual. So what, what is the CNN effect? I think we need a little bit uh, an explanation of that. This is a common view of the power... You have a pointer here, though? No? Yeah. This is a common view of the power of the media, especially television journalism, which through emotive images moves the public to demand action, to demand action of its government. The CNN effect pushes the government into foreign policy pursuits that otherwise they would not adopt. Because if they adopt it, then it's not, it's not a CNN effect. Um, in response to public opinion. So I think this is just a fair description of what the CNN effect is all about. So we have a number of sequences here. This is uh, the typical CNN effect sequence. You have pictures. The pictures arouse public opinion, which then forces a, a, a policy, a particular policy preference on governments. But this is not the whole story. There are, all, uh, there are other possibilities as well. Uh, for example, obviously policymakers also watch uh, news and they may be affected directly without public opinion. And the, the last sequ and, and, and this sequence is even more interesting. What about policymakers who are interested in a particular policy? They don't think they have enough public support for that policy. So what they do, they initiate the pictures. They then promote public opinion to support their policies. Oh, wait a minute. So we have all kinds of sequences here. And I think this, this is what happened in Somalia. Uh, US government wanted to intervene and needed uh, pictures to support intervention that they thought the public would not necessarily approve of. So all kinds of options and possibilities here. Uh, the whole CNN effect came from, uh, this, is, this is communication, I don't know how much you know about communication. I'll go very briefly about the concepts that are critical to any understanding of the CNN effect. So what the media, what the media are doing, they set, uh, they set the agenda, they tell us what to think about, but framing is what to think, not just what to think about. And priming is how to think about what criteria we should use in order to evaluate the particular person, event, process, etc. So this is like a family of media events. This is one source of the CNN effect. The second source is this, like media attention. If the media uh, is interested in a particular story, you have political attention, and then you have political action. Like again, this is like a sequence. The second, the second sequence here is related to the amount and type of coverage. So we have massive coverage, massive public relations support, massive aid or intervention, humanitarian aid or intervention. Uh, this is also typical of uh, uh, communication media theory, but uh, you know these are the functions and these functions of uh, of media. But I want to draw your attention to this one: mobilization. So certain actors mobilize the media to achieve certain goals, and if the original formulation, Dennis McQuay, the original formulation of this 
referred only to governments, but we know today that non-state actors, non-governmental organizations, they know to do very well with mobilizing the media. So again, all kinds of functions and dysfunctions. This function means that the media intends to provide a service, but it backfires. So this is dysfunction. Uh, I cannot go too much into these types of journalism. Uh, you know, like this place has produced peace journalism. But I think uh, the, interesting, the interesting concept here is journalism of detachment, which was developed by Martin Bell. Uh, this is back from, I guess, from Bosnia, right? Yeah. From Bosnia. So this is how he defined journalism of attachment. Again, I'm taking you through the road to the CNN effect or to the implication of the CNN effect. This is his definition of what, uh, what journalism of attachment is. Cares, as well as knows, is aware <laughs> of its responsibilities and will not stand neutral between good and evil, right and wrong, the victim and the oppressor, meaning the media is an actor, not just as a neutral source of information. You know, you'll talk about Al Jazeera. For me, Al Jazeera is an international actor. It's a news organization uh, performing in international relations as an actor, not just as a typical uh, media organization. Uh, these, these were the two <coughs> major uh, technological uh, uh, revolutions in communication. Well, you know all of that. I don't think I need to repeat that. Except that global all news networks, around the clock broadcasting, global access and reach, these are the innovations. Real time coverage, live event oriented, very important, live event oriented, and headline dominated. Headline dominated. Uh, what is interesting, I think, which we need to take into consideration, counter global news networks. So we have seen in the last 10 years proliferation of global news networks. You see some of them here. To me, it's always amazing to see France 24. I remember when it was prohibited to put signs in English in the streets of Paris. Suddenly they have a global television network in English. So what's the idea? All of these channels are arguing, oh, CNN International, BBC World, they present Western point of view. The, these, these views are highly distorted. We need our own. So you have counter global news networks. We have regional news networks. These are developments of the last 10 years. So you can see some of them here. And look at Al Jazeera. We have counter Al Jazeera regional networks. So Ahura and Al Arabiya. So this, these developments have expanded the horizon of the CNN effect. So new media, you know of this. But you know, this has become a, a mega weapon for all kinds of actors and agencies, citizens and people. We need to look at the concept of the citizen journalist. Everyone with a cell phone, with a camera, is a reporter without any qualifications, and you don't know what the picture comes from, what is the agenda of the person, etc. Um, what, what I've described to you created what we call today new politics. And I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I have written here a number of terms, postmodern terms, which I don't necessarily like, such as medialism, like socialism, communism, liberalism, mediocracy, like democracy, theocracy, uh, media polity, teledemocracy, emphasizing television or pictures. It's not, it's not the medium, it's the picture. So regardless, old media, new media, it's the picture that is important here. Teledemocracy, telepopulism. We have many, this is, uh, this is probably known to you, we have many, many actors, new actors in uh, international relations, we have states, and you know, every, everybody else is non-state, non-state actor, like a negative definition of all the others. And this is just a brief list of all these, of all these new actors. Uh, <coughs> so we have these terms that I've mentioned earlier on 
domestic politics, we have, new, uh, we have similar terms on international politics. New diplomacy, public diplomacy, media diplomacy, headline diplomacy, tele-diplomacy, and the CNN effect. So the CNN effect belongs here to this family of terms that I don't think are very successful, but they testify to the need of scholars to, to understand new developments in media and international relations. So this is my model of the new landscape of media and international relations. And uh, as you can see here, we have, this is actor, non, actor, actor could be government, non-governmental organization, international organization. Here we have the international community. Then you have actor with, the, with its own media, society and public opinion. Here you have global and regional television and the internet. Uh, and then you have another actor. And what is important, I think, in this figure, it shows you new types of relationship among actors, states and non-state actors in contemporary international relations. So you can have all kinds of relations here, like here, directly here, all kinds of relations. So I think this figure uh, is, a, is, I think, is, is a useful tool for any analysis of contemporary CNN effects Obviously, you can easily identify CNN effects in this particular, in this particular figure. Um, so, uh, I suggested that as well in, in one of my articles. Uh, all of the developments in the media uh, it, have created a new typology of media levels. Media levels. So, we start from, from the local, city, county, national, uh, like a country, uh, a country like New York Times. You know, CNN has CNN US and CNN International. BBC what? BBC UK and BBC World Service, correct? If you, has anybody compared the two? CNN and BBC, I think there are a couple of studies, yeah. Well, I'm still waiting for a major study to show some interesting differences because this is obviously national. And, and if you look, uh, the next level is regional. We have talked about that. After that, we have international. I've made a distinction between international and global. I've been criticized severely for this, but nonetheless, I'm standing my, by my distinction because I'm arguing, as you can see here, for me, international means, <laughs> as the term suggests, is, it is, it's a, a, a global uh, news networks but based on some national values, uh, ideas, it, it, is pre it presents a national perspective. So I think Voice of America, obviously, Deutsche Welle, Al Jazeera International, Russia Today, all of these. But I think we need to distinguish, even if you disagree uh, with the examples, we must have uh, a, a category for global, uh, global television. So I'm thinking, you know, people say CNN International is, is, is an American global news organization, so maybe we see well, this is International Herald Tribune, print uh, media, which is being circulated around the world. Global for me means that at least you, uh, you attempt to present news from non-national perspectives. Now, if you argue that this is what CNN International is doing, then CNN International would be here rather than here. But I think we need still this category here. Then you have the local, which is which is new media, both both local and, and global. Uh, this is too complicated to explain right now. But what I want to suggest here that this is again I have developed this uh, technology. <coughs> I'm, I'm bombing you with technologies, but this is what I've been doing in the last 20 years, coming up with all kinds of conceptual frameworks for analysis and for understanding which I think is very important. So I have, I have prepared here a, a simple typology of media-government relations because the CNN effect is basically one pattern of media-government relations. So reflecting at all, this is indexing. I simply don't have time to go into this. I hope you know what indexing is all about. 
collaborating actor, participating actor. So I'm looking at the media as acting vis-a-vis -vis the government. So reflecting government, collaborating with government, participating with government, rivaling government. Oh, and here, for me, the sanity fact is a controlling actor because it supposedly it takes over uh, policy making from government. So we, we can add see the CNN effect into various typologies of media and international relations and uh, levels of media and media government relations. And I've just demonstrated to you how this could be done. And this has been an innovation of the last 20 years or so, and it's being expanded all the time. Uh, Pierre talked about it, so I'm not going to go into this. Uh, this is a big debate of the 90s. Does it exist? Many argue does not exist. Some people say exists. When? Only in certain situations. Only in extreme situations. Uh, impact, enormous, some positive, negative. Uh, and so I would not go into this. What is interesting for me as a theoretician, and I've done work on it, I'm, argue, I'm arguing that the, re, that the results of your research on the CNN effect is being determined primarily by the theoretical uh, uh, binoculars you use to research that issue. So here I have all kinds of, uh, all kinds of theoretical frameworks. Uh, and when you, use, when you use one of those frameworks, you are likely to get a particular result of your research on the CNN effect. Again, we need to look at it, we need to look at those at those uh, different perspectives and frameworks on uh, on um, on the CNN effect. This is an interesting one. Global civil society. Here, uh, a number of scholars have argued since the government is not doing its job in society, domestic society, the government governments don't do a good job. So other social agents like the media assume responsibility for certain actions and policies at the domestic level. What they did is to expand the whole idea into uh, international relations and the global society. So the CNN effect for them is uh, an example of the global society taking responsibility, doing, uh, influencing, applying pressure on governments to do what they need to do at the global level. This is just an example of how this could be done. Uh, too many methodologies, we'll skip this. Um, this, is, uh, this is important because some people said the CNN effect may exist only if certain conditions are fulfilled. This is where Pierre has contributed uh, much in his own works. And the argument is that in order for the CNN effect to exist, there should be conditions at two different areas. One government, one the media. And the combination of the two yield the best promising conditions for the CNN effect to emerge and to operate. So, for example, unpredictable, this is media. Unpredictable void in the news cycles. I've summarized the all kinds of approaches. Dramatic images, simple issue framing, this is peers. Policy making, policy panic, policy uncertainty, this is yours. So when you have, for, for peers, his media policy model is based on a combination of two components. First of all, policy uncertainty. So if the policy makers don't know what to do, someone is trying to tell them what to do. And the media is perhaps one of the most uh, influential actors to tell them what to do. So policy uncertainty framing. But this depends if you have, if you have policy certainty, the chances of the CNN effect according to him would be slim. If you have policy uncertainty and the media do nothing, you don't have the CNN effect. If there is policy uncertainty and there is a campaign by the media to do something, then the CNN effect has a chance to, uh, to exist. 
this is the, this is the most important case of the well, most interesting case. <coughs> you uh, mentioned that um, what I did is to look at various uh, various uh, approaches. As I've told you earlier, to Somalia, and this is what Pierre referred to earlier as a mixed bag. So I've looked into uh, various perspectives used to under, to uh, investigate. Uh, media, the media role in Somalia. Look at this. So, so two people writing from the perspective of realism. This is Michael Mandelbaum, who wrote a very interesting piece in Foreign Affairs. It's called The Foreign Policy of Mother Teresa. As a realist, he couldn't find any national reason for the United States to intervene in Somalia. Okay, no reason. If there is no reason, then what determine what pushed the United States to intervene in Somalia didn't any effect. Hey, but I found somebody else, this guy, also from realism, he said, no, no, it was, a, it was not the CNN, it was something else. And you can see here a number of people uh, using different ideas to determine whether or not the CNN effect occurred in a particular case. And this was, this was one of the most famous cases of the CNN effect, you can find today, even today, all kinds of citations, especially by political scientists who know very little about communication, who say, oh, in Somalia, it was a CNN effect that forced the United States to intervene there. Uh, we'll leave this. Uh, this is an important point. Uh, we move uh, slowly into contemporary CNN effects. And I think what you see today in the world, uh, in the past, most of uh, the conflicts in the world were interstate conflicts. But today we see like this, and we see much more here, sub-state level. Look, we see civil wars, we see warfare and violence between state and non-state actors around the world. So I think this level, is very important and this is where we need to conduct much more effective research and innovative research today on contemporary CNN effects. So in the past this was like the main main thing. Today this is the main thing. We'll skip this. This is low intensity. Oh I, I made also a distinction why in one of my works between high intensity conflict and low intensity conflict. And this is also very important. Low intensity conflict means that uh, it's, not, it's not a huge uh, uh, eruption of violence. It's much more limited. It's long. Uh, uh, it's highly problematic. I, here I have all the components. And sometimes, like in the, for the United States, uh, the invasion of Iraq in, 19, in 2003 was high intensity conflict. But the violence that uh, erupted afterwards has been low intensity conflict. Uh, I've done uh, recently a study of uh, the world, so to speak, mostly United States and NATO, that's going to be published next year, on Arab Spring. You see Libya and Syria, humanitarian intervention uh, options. And I have identified the following uh, variables that determine whether to intervene or not and could explain why the United States and NATO intervene in Libya and are refraining, refraining, refraining from, refraining from uh, intervention in Syria. So I have here a number of, uh, on a number of uh, variables that I think are very important and social media. Uh, the uprising in Egypt has been called the, the, well, the Facebook revolution. It was not the Facebook revolution. I think what happened in Egypt, in terms of media, uh, what, what, what was the most important element, what, what, what were the most important elements? First of all, street information, street media communication. What was talked in, 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 in the mosques. And Al Jazeera, which picked up information from, from the street. So uh, this is something that, uh, as I said, needs, needs to be, needs to be uh, analyzed. Uh, and I think 
this was an important, an important factor, not the decisive one. Conclusions. I think it's a viable concept. I think it does exist in certain situations. It depends on several conditions. We still need to work on those conditions. Well, we have, uh, Pierre uh, said, uh, said a lot about it. Many changes in international uh, uh, relations, especially in international conflict, changes in the media, we combine the two. And uh, contemporary CNN effects must be understood uh, in view of all of those changes in conflict and media. Today we talk about media framing uh, in terms of fights, especially media pluralism suggests that we have framing fights among different actors. Media framing is only one type of framing. And someone is winning that. So who is winning framing fights? It has to be expanded and tested. And I congratulate here uh, the Peace Research Institute for initiating a major project that will attempt to go into uh, contemporary CNN, CNN effects and understand them much better than we do today. Thank you very much. covering the Arab uprisings. Um, first, a disclaimer, I have not uh, studied uh, the Arab uprisings myself. I've been working on other projects, but I have uh, done extensive research on Al Jazeera English, their editorial strategies and editorial line. Oops. Wait, <laughs> Chloe. <laughs> Okay, so I guess most of you know um, Al Jazeera. It is important to um, acknowledge that they are a um, media network that has a number of niche, niche channels in addition to the two news channels, uh, the Arab Arabic one and the English one. Um, I've been researching Al Jazeera uh, for about 10 years and I've made several uh, inquiries about their relations with the Qatari uh, authorities since they are indeed funded by the royal family of Qatar. Uh, the last time I asked, this is the definition I got from Al Jazeera Network, that they are what they say an independent public institution. So they are editorially independent, they claim, but um, they are financed by the authorities of Qatar. And I mention this now because it is, I think it's very important to keep in mind uh, whenever we talk about Al Jazeera, that they are very closely linked to Qatar. Um, um, as was stressed in the, in the last presentation, it, it, it covers the world um, from Qatar and it has a localized um, news perspective. Al Jazeera sources often uh, uh, compare themselves to the BBC 
and say that the BBC is also and, and other public broadcasters. But the, the political systems are very different. Qatar is an absolute democracy and there is no media freedom within Qatar. And Al Jazeera is semi-independent, but only as long as they do not challenge Qatar or Qatari interests. So this is, this is how Al Jazeera see themselves. And it is important to know that they, they want to brand themselves and they, they see themselves as a uh, news control flow. They want to, as you see, they want to cover the world from underreported regions. They want to balance and counter what they see as a Western news dominance. And they brag about unique access, particularly to the Middle East and Africa, but all, all over the, the global south. And, and also they have coverage of international conflicts covered from, their, from the ground as one of their um, There has been talks about a CNN effect since uh, no sorry an Al Jazeera effect since since the channel since the Arabic channel was first launched um, I would say that the the way that the Arabic Al Jazeera channel covered um, uh, the events following 9-11 and also the, the wars on terror um, and before that and after that and in between uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think that the main effect we saw from that was um, increased awareness within media and, and polit political circles primarily that there was indeed other perspective on these international events and and that the so-called cosmopolitan or global um, editorial lines of, of CNN and BBC World as they were presented in the 90s what did not resonate with global publics all over the world and and also from the coverage of the um, Arabic Al Jazeera channel and the other Arab news channels, we saw that there, there, there was images of civilian suffering that we had not seen on Western news outlets before. And this doesn't mean that Western media changed their coverage of international conflicts overnight, but journalists were increasingly aware that there are more than one perspective. And you could see even here in Norway, even in the regional newspaper from where I'm from, from the West Coast, um, you could see that they would sometimes print images like, this is how the war in Gaza looks like in Arab media. They have a different view. We have to be aware that our version of events is not the only one. Um, parallel with that, we have uh, had claims of changing relationships between the Arab street, the Arab public, and, and, and their um, rulers. Uh, what has been a problem with many of these works and books is that they have not been empirically grounded. The evidence have been very anecdotal, and although the, <laughs> the idea of an Al Jazeera effect is very compelling, it is it's very hard to, when you look into the methodologies, when you try to, to look into their findings, it's very hard to, to find what it's based on. But, but it was an idea, and I would say that if you have very strong beliefs in the media effect, when discussing the CNN effect, it is, has even been bigger when, when, when discussing how media in the Arab world would change everything. And so it is almost like media scholars that are usually quite skeptical of media effects. Whenever you, you take your theories to the Arab world, you would have <laughs> very, very strong beliefs in a direct media effect. So that whenever you show something 
On television, people would, would argue without investigating this, that this will also change politics and how... Um, and I think reality television is, is one example, because um, entertainment uh, talent shows like Idol and these and X Factor and these programs have been very popular in the Arab world. And I've seen numerous analysis claiming that this will teach Arabs how to vote. And since they now have <laughs> voted for, for World Idol, they will also start voting in. Those concepts are mine. Those are not strategies that they will uh, necessarily agree with. But for me, the f from, from interviewing them and reading strategic documents, and, and I would say that a southern presence is, is one of their key strategies. And Al Jazeera, the Al Jazeera network with the two Al Jazeera channels, has an extensive presence around the world um, and particularly in areas where other channels and other media players are not. So when, when all the commercially driven uh, international media will have to pull back the correspondence, Al Jazeera can send out their people. They also have four headquarters, with, which is a very uh, decentralized and and complex and expensive way of producing news. And they have made it sort of a strategy of being in dangerous, controversial hotspots. And of course, the Middle East and, and, and Northern Africa are, are important, but, but also in, in Asia and South Saharan Africa. So, uh, during the fall of 2007, when you had the, the protests and uprisings in Burma, they were there in the streets. And also, uh, they, when they first launched in 2006, Al Jazeera English, they, they opened offices in Harare. And this was at the time when the BBC and, and other international um, broadcasters were not allowed to operate inside Zimbabwe. What again is important to note is that this is a very expensive way of producing international news. And this is only possible because they are directly funded by the royal family in Qatar. So this can go, <laughs> this goes on as long as Qatari authorities uh, feel they can benefit from this. Okay, the second strategy is it's closely connected to the, the first one. And this is that they try to hire local correspondents. Of course, this is something that is uh, often mentioned in public speeches and, and interviews. And this is something that looks good. If you want to be a counter a perspective, if you want to have a southern perspective on world events, it, it's it's nice to, to brag about that you hire local correspondents. Um, they do to a certain extent. It is impossible to get full lists of who works where from the Al Jazeera, at least it was for me. Um, but what you often see is that... Oops. Sorry, TV2. <laughs> Your mic is just in my way. <laughs> Can I put it here? That's all right. Whatever. Um, you often see mixed teams where, where you hire one younger local correspondent and you team him or her up with a more experienced um, producer. Um, this is similar to how um, alternative media um, hire native reporters. So this is, it has to do with that bottom-up perspective that they want to have on events. Um, during the years that I studied Al Jazeera English, they had very mixed results with this approach. Some of the local uh, correspondents worked uh, 
in a 24-7 news format, others didn't. And so th there has been a lot of experimenting in, with, with this um, approach. What, what is more important, I would claim, is that the management, at least in the first years that I've studied the channel, they were very similar to the media management in all major news networks all over the world. They were white middle-aged British men. And in fact, at the time when I was there, they all came from ITV, all seven of them. And they looked very much the same. They were like this. And they, and they were very proud. And of course, if you want to launch a new global network, it's a very complicated operation. And you want to work with people that you trust. And, and the ITV crew, they had experience with launching a new channel. And so they, um, it probably makes, made sense, but this caused a lot of internal uh, conflicts and they didn't go particularly well with the original Arabic, Al Jazeera Arabic channel and the people there. Um, which brings me to the third strategy, and that is to work together within the Al Jazeera family. That you, that they would try to take advantage of the 10 years that Al Jazeera Arabic had been on air, their extensive source networks and their regional expertise. Um, at the time that I was there, there were a lot of mutual suspicion and conflicts going on between the two channels. It's a very long story that I won't go into today, but there were an, many misunderstandings and clumsy <laughs> uh, statements and people tended to, to regard the other with suspicion and to... Um, so 2008 was supposed to be the year of integration to integrate the network closer. And also they tried to integrate uh, the bureaus in the field because they had, often they had two separate bureaus in, in separate buildings. And this doesn't make sense. I would claim that <coughs> the Gaza war was the first successful uh, cooperation between the two. And that had to do, of course, with the very um, um, situation inside Gaza because there were only very few teams inside um, Gaza. And other international journalists could not access the con Gaza, so those that were inside uh, the war zone would work very closely together. And also with their teams in Israel. And so, so that was, and that's something that they were very, very happy about, how they covered the Gaza war, and also that they managed to, to work so, so well together. <clears throat> These strategies um, lead to some editorial characteristics or some broader features that um, set Al Jazeera apart from other global news uh, outlets. The first, the first one is that they have a geographical emphasis on the global south, particularly um, Middle East and Northern Africa, of course. Uh, I've, I've done extensive content analysis and found that they have more coverage um, they are there on the ground in the global south, and also that they cover the south in longer um, formats. And this is go this is very opposite of what you see in, in most global news networks. Um, since Al Jazeera is a um, international news channel, you will not find it, it will be elite dominated. But what I find is that you open up and you have more alternative elites or independent elites that I've uh, um, called it. So you have more um, civil society, you have more activists, you have more opposition movements of all kinds. And of course you have the establishment and the people in office as well, but 
they do not dominate the coverage. Um, very little, very few regular people are on uh, Al Jazeera English, like in, in most channels, because international news are very elite dominated. And also, the graphic images is a very difficult term, but I, I, I use it at, um, here in the sense that they, they are on the ground, they have different uh, ethical standards, maybe we could say, um, about what you can show and not. And this, particularly during conflicts and, and um, <clears throat> So that, and also in humanitarian uh, crisis. So you see more suffering, they go closer and they show more than you will in, in, the, in the Western news media. And this, this, of course, this also has to do that, with that they are not commercially motivated. They, have, they don't really have um, companies that they want to please. To, to put their ads on Al Jazeera. So they are, they are very dependent on, on Qatar, but they are very independent of commercial uh, interests. So what I've tried to do here is, is how, does, how did this influence how they covered the Arab uprisings? And, and why was Al Jazeera the big name, at least, uh, among the more traditional media, Al Jazeera was the, this was their moment. They had a smaller moment <laughs> when they covered the, the Gaza war. They got some international attention for that. But the Gaza war is way more controversial and complicated in a way than at least the first waves of, of uh, uprisings in, in, in Arab Spring. So, of course, they had. They have their geographical focus on the Middle East and North African region. And so from the very start, they had a very strong comparative advantage here. And years of expertise in understanding what was going on. And also, I think that the fact that they have had, have had um, permanent correspondence on the ground for some time and also that some of them were local and knew the language and knew the culture and, and the political system that, that gave them other sources and other information so that they were better prepared. And also as the, as the conflicts um, started, they, they interviewed these alternative elites. So they interviewed, um, protesters, bloggers, and they, they invited them even into the studios. They interviewed bloggers like they were the prime minister of Egypt. Uh, and again, um, particularly in, in, in Egypt, you had very dramatic images from the ground. And, and, and here you both had Al Jazeera cameras on the ground, and they had their live channel Broadcasting live, and um, but also increasingly they put on uh, user-generated content. People, uh, their people's um, cell phone clips, and and so on. So just to sum up, they validated the protest movements. Um, And I would say that they, they gave their authority and they spread the basic messages of, of the protesters. And they also um, made it a media event, particularly Egypt, very quickly into the protest. They made it into, they framed it as a revolutionary movement. And this is important because then again, you. Um, you accord them uh, authority and you support them indirectly without having to state so. And also, again, they used uh, people's own clips and, 
and impressions from the street. In addition to their many teams of reporters and photographers that walked ar around in the streets with the protesters. Um, and all the time they countered the official versions of events so that and they would go back and forth between the two just to, to sort of say this is the official version but this is what's going on on the street. So they empty the official version of all their credibility. Um, and in many of these conflicts they were authorities tried to, to stop their, their reporting. We have had many um, instances of authorities or police or thugs um, trying to arrest them, close down their cameras, and, and for, for extensive periods they had to, to cover the, the events um, without using the reporters' names and without and only by phoning in to that uh, headquarters. So again, I, I think it's important to be very cautious here, and, and this goes for both those that want to look into how social media affected the events and also studies of how uh, more traditional media influenced on the events. And I hope that those that will do this uh, are try strive to be more systematic and critical than previous uh, research and most of the previous research on Arab media has been, unfortunately. Um, it's important to look into the different political con um, <coughs> context and also to always keep in mind the Qatari owners and how their um, relations and how their foreign policy ambitions and how their role is in the different uh, um, conflicts here. And I will end with this very fundamental dilemma that Al Jazeera has. And that is that Qatar uses Al Jazeera to be a bigger regional and international player than they are today. But this is not the only... Um, they, they work on many arenas and, and Al Jazeera is one of them. And I think that Al Jazeera, the, the public diplomacy or the, the, the way they try to, to use Al Jazeera is different from, from other states because Qatar is a micro state. So it's, it's, it's not about um, covering Qatar and promoting Qatar directly on Al Jazeera. Qatar is rarely there. You see the Doha skyline whenever they read the news. You see these long commercials or for Qatari interests that will brand Qatar, but they don't, they stay away from covering Qatari affairs. You have some sunshine news stories sometimes about hospitals, um, universities, but usually Qatar just isn't there. And if Qatar Will, and Qatar's political and economic influence will grow, then Al Jazeera will have to start turning their cameras on themselves in a way, on Qatar. And I don't think that's possible. So, because um, we have seen other examples of Qatar inviting in, for instance, reports without borders, for them to set up this independent this, um, center inside Qatar. And it was closed down when, after a very short time when they tried to investigate local affairs. So, so this is, I would say that Al Jazeera cannot cover Qatar critically. And, and when, for instance, when Qatar will host um, 
the FIFA World Championship in 2020. I, I don't remember the year. But then they will have, and, and probably all these mega stadiums that are very impressive that, that they have, will, they will all be built by guest workers that will probably work under very harsh conditions. And this is something that they will have to cover. And I'm very, I don't know, I'm very curious of how that will turn. <laughs> okay, that's all, thank you. <clears throat> So, thank you um, all three of you for very interesting um, introductions. Um, I have several questions, but just first, um, I'll just let you know that there is coffee and fruit and biscuits here, so you're free to um, have a go if you're just discreet while we're uh, talking. Um, I'll start off by asking a few questions myself before I, um, I'll let you have your, your questions. Um, there's one, one common theme in all, all three introductions about how the changing media landscape is creating more plurality and whether this is a good thing or not and how it works out. So I'll start with you, Pierce um, Robinson. Um, you said in, in one way the landscape is dramatically different but still familiar and there are two ways of looking at this. An optimistic view that um, this is pluralizing power gives voice to the voiceless and then the other argument that it makes things more fragmented. Um, me personally, I'm from, from the old media, uh, still working for a company whose business model is to, to cut down trees and, and print things on paper. Uh, and I realize this is not the, the way of the future, but I would still argue that um, there is a need for a, some kind of centralized uh, filter to use in order to, to um, get through with the message. Um, and you said in a sort of academic way that it's still unclear which which way this goes, if it makes more fragmentation or more um, gives more power. So I would challenge you to, to elaborate on that. Uh, what, what is your personal sense um, on this dilemma? First of all, I, I agree completely with your statement that you, we still need, one still needs, like, audible, I am audible, aren't I? Yes, I'll talk now if I've got a mic with me. But you clearly still need, in terms of sort of normative aspirations surrounding the public sphere and uh, development of opinion, opinion formation, you've got to have some kind of filtering and some kind of agenda setting and some kind of media which is actually, in a sense, broadcasting to masses rather than narrow casting and so on. And if you don't have that, then I think you have a lot of problems in terms of realizing all those kind of have a massing ideas about the public sphere and so on, dissemination of information, opinion formation, and then that influencing democratic processes and so on. So you've got to have this question is, you know, what's happening to that now? Because it's quite clear that we're in a different environment where we don't have the traditional, as it were, broadcasting and mass audiences that we used to have. And I guess that's the question I'm posing, is that this could be, we could be heading down a very, in a sense, pretty dangerous road in democratic terms because of this environment. You know, the, the kind of, the commitment we have to, for example, public service broadcasting, I know we have lots of problems with you know, public service broadcasting, and so on, but the kind of commitment to that is under a lot of threat in this, in the internet era, which is essentially commercially driven, and so on, the market's driving it, and so on. Um, and in, in, in that sense, you know, you have got some threats to some of the components of certainly European democracies, you know, the combination of public service broadcasting and commercial media, you've got a threat to the continuation of that. And some people would say, if you remove that from the media sphere, then you have an increasingly commercialized infotainment orientated media, etc. And it's a problem for democracy and so on. So I, 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 think, I think we're really heading into an area where there are a lot of dangers. And this is why I always tend to be sort of a bit irritating to people who sort of get very over enthusiastic about the levels of pluralization and so on, because I, I think it's not as, obvious that that's happening and I think there are real dangers at this point in time. I mean, I could be sort of mildly polemical for a second, but, you know, say the Iraq conflict, we had tremendous transparency of information around the Iraq conflict and we did, even in the run-up to the conflict, tremendous amount of information circulating because of the internet and so on and so forth. But if you look at how that was translated, certainly in the US and the UK in terms of 
uh, propensity of the media to reflect what the government was promoting and the controversial run-up to that conflict. I won't go into all the propaganda operations and so on. Um, you know, there was a tremendous lack of ability, despite this new media environment, despite these sources of journalists, to really get it right in that case. Hence, you had the New York Times apologising and various degrees of apologies from UK journalists about what happened and so on. So you know, this environment isn't necessarily changing everything and so on. So, and, and I think that some kind of, and I'll stop in a second, some kind of notion of what it is we need from the media and what kind of media system we need to actually enable democracy, the kind of debates that we were having in the early 1990s over the public sphere, how we help create a public sphere, facilitate a public sphere, that we really need to be having those discussions not necessarily academics who are focused on explaining and describing what's going on, but certainly sort of those interested in sort of normative discussions. Those debates need to be had now, and I, and I just don't hear those debates happening at all. I, I see us heading straight headlong into a very diversified media environment, which is very unclear if this is really going to work in democratic terms. I'd like you to follow up, uh, Ethan Gilbal. Um, yeah. you, you, call the, you call the Twitter or the a mobile phone, a mega weapon. So, what's your take on that? Can I just uh, add a few things? Sure. Yes. First of all, I think I regret that uh, the printed media are losing ground and newspapers are being closed around the world. Uh, I think that, uh, at least from my experience with, uh, with the new media, there is a lot of stuff there that is completely fabricated, distorted, misleading, and young people read it as if it. It is the whole truth. I think the answer is media education and media literacy. I think nothing is being done, in, at least to the best of my knowledge, in many countries. Uh, very little effort is being done to educate young people. Number one, to understand that not everything that is printed in, in the internet is correct and is important and is credible. And number two, there's not enough education of young people to read newspapers, just to read newspapers and books. They don't do it, they don't do it much anymore. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the academia and, and, and the print media and the, and the media in general have many things in common. One thing is that they don't want to reveal anything about themselves. You try to get information about, <laughs> about uh, policy making in universities and how people are promoted and you will get no information whatsoever. And I've, I've, I've found, in my experience, um, uh, I've attempted to gain information, to get information from the media about what they are doing. You can get any information from the media as a scholar. And I'm asking myself, what's going on here? The media is asking everybody else to provide information, but it would not reveal information about itself. So um, I think that we have a major problem in media, what I call media education, in, in terms of, of how, how to use wisely uh, the, the many sources that we have today. And again, I'm going back to my initial statement. I am afraid that people do what we call in, in media like selective exposure. This is the term. We have not done enough research about selective exposure. But I think that if you just go to the source that you think is compatible with your beliefs, then what kind of people are we going to, are we going to educate in, in a democracy? This is, this is exactly the opposite of what democracy is all about. I think I agree with you that there's a major problem here. Now, in terms of weapon, uh, I think that what well, media, and this is, the, this is a point I perhaps have not emphasized enough in my lecture. I think the media serve both as an instrument in the hands of all kinds of agencies, governmental, non-governmental, all, all, all kinds of organizations. At the same time, the media also serve as an independent actor uh, which ha ha have a, an agenda and or campaigning to implement that agenda. So it's both uh, uh, it's both an instrument as well as an independent actor, like CNN, in fact, independent actor with an agenda. Now, so it is what I meant by a weapon. For me, information, you know, knowledge is power. Uh, power could serve as a weapon 
in all kinds of battles. Um, the thin any fact refers to all kinds of battles. And so I, I, for me, uh, for me, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it as a weapon, first of all, as a weapon that is directed against the user, going back to what we have said earlier about, about the internet, as a weapon, you, you, don't, you don't understand that this is a weapon, first of all, that is directed against you and maybe directed against others. This is what I meant. That, it, that it, it's a very dangerous, you know, you know, the smartphone has become a very dangerous weapon and most people who use it are not aware of it. But still, as, as a weapon, is it, uh, is a tweet worth anything if, unless the CNN or the New York Times or someone picks it up and makes it a news story? Okay, so there are, there are positive contributions and, and negative contributions, is what I'm saying. It's a double, double edged sword. It, you know, like a screwdriver could be used to, to unscrew something or you can scratch a car. So, this is the whole thing. This is what I meant uh, that uh, it, could be, it, 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 it could be a useful tool. You know, I heard uh, a New York Times editor saying, I, all, I look uh, every morning, I look at certain blogs to see how am I doing? And this is the New York Times. Have they found something that I have not done right? So if you look at, at, the, at the new media as, uh, as a, a potential uh, check on the traditional media, uh, bringing information that is, is important, then fine. If, if the traditional media, and this is what's going on, look, the most successful blogs have been bought by the print media. So I'm asking myself, so what is the aspiration of a blogger? You know, a blogger wants to, to be bought by a traditional media, after all. And so the, the relationship here between the traditional media and, and, uh, and, and, and the new media, look at Wikileaks. Right? Wikileaks did not rely upon, upon themselves. They made contracts with all kinds of traditional media to disseminate information. And I think that most of the information that people know from Wikileaks, uh, most of this information is not from the Wikileaks web. It's from the printed versions, from the versions that were picked up by the traditional media, all kinds of media in the world. So, th so I think that as, as a scholar, I have a difficult time dealing with all of that. Because by the time I'm able to overcome one thing, then another thing comes out. And what you've written becomes obsolete because you, know, you, you can't keep up. It's, it's so fast. And both of us are also in international politics. Uh, I define my field as international communication. So it's international relations and communication. You know, you're running like, you're running all the time and, and trying to understand what's going on and m most of the time events are ahead of you you simply you now i'm trying I'm a theorist i'm trying to develop tools for analysis and i'm asking myself yeah, I'm, I'm developing a tool how long it will survive in the past you would develop tools for 10 years something like that and every time you you refine the tool based on uh, on on developments in the field but today you know this thing might not might not survive like a year or so. So I think as, as scholars of international communication, uh, I think we, we have many, op the time is very interesting. We have many interesting things to do, uh, many interesting challenges, but it has become more and more difficult to understand them. Seeing any facts included. <clears throat> Can yeah, I just, sure. um, I just wanted to add to that, uh, I, I agree uh, completely with the call for more media uh, awareness and, and to to teach young people and and also I would say also older generations in how to what what to make of, of all the new media but I think that there, there is a higher awareness at least within uh, within the the traditional media because you see more of the meta coverage than than you did before but at least at least here in in Norway, whenever there's a big story 
A couple of days into the story, you will have the story about how the media covers the story. And as media scholars, you, you're, you're ask, always asked to comment and analyze what the different media, um, what does it mean, the different perspectives, why do they do like that. And also when you listen to people, everyone's a media critic these days. And this, I think this also has to do with the social media that I'm not sure what people are doing there is a, a media critique. But at the same time, I, we have students that use Wikipedia as a trustful source when they write papers. So, so there's a discrepancy there. And, and I don't know what to make of it, but I, I think that there is an increase of awareness and people are more critical to a certain extent. Um, to criticize the media they don't like. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I want to go, go back to this um, uh, notion of uh, giving power to the powerless. Um, when I look at my colleagues, or most, most media people, in, at least in Norway today, I think it goes for many countries, they are rather obsessed with Twitter especially, uh, spending all day looking at tweets and getting feedback from their uh, readers and their audience, and they uh, tend to, uh, to take that as uh, the, uh, the society as a whole. When someone tweets something to you, that's, that's your, the feedback you get. And it's very intriguing because you get very direct response. But what about all those people who are not on the internet, who don't have mobile phones, who don't have tweets, especially looking at Arab Spring and uh, his perspectives from the South? Is it, are we just replacing one old elite with a new elite, or is this really a tool of democratization? Well, I guess initially, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair enough point that sort of clearly most people in the world don't have access to that technology and so on. I guess the broader picture, the same arguments which are made about television and radio would be that this technology would over time proliferate and so on. So it's conceivable where you have an environment where everyone has access to this. I mean, I think mobile phone penetration is extraordinary. Steve Livingston and stuff on that in Africa and so on. That this technology will become available and so on. Um, I think it's even if you have, as it were, everybody included because of the dissemination and the proliferation of, of that kind of technology, you know, you've got some big questions to be addressed there. I mean, I'm slightly worried. I mean, do, do journalists, I mean, how much the proportion of their as it were, journalism is being generated from Twitter? I mean, I get, I, Way too much. Yeah, I mean, I get, see, if you look at people who've done these studies, I mean, not so much on Twitter, but people who do these studies of, you know, comment and feedback on, on stories and so on, and, and the analysis of the quality of the discourse, and you can see how rapidly these things just degenerate into slanging patches between two people and so on. This isn't high quality communication, uh, and I haven't seen a similar study done on Twitter, but I'm guessing it's going to be pretty much the same. This is not high quality discussion information which is going on there and so on. So I think this is not something which journalists should be being driven by um, if the objective is to try and get in-depth quality news coverage. Maybe there's an issue of education and journalists. <laughs> I think it's important to take into consideration that the Twitter format um, fav um, forwards or um, helps a certain kind of story. So there are only those stories that you can make a witty, sarcastic twist on that will be very big on Twitter. So that um, famine in Ethiopia will not be a major bus story on Twitter. So that is a lot of the more serious, important, hard news stories will not be present in these formats because it's 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 very risky to take your uh, <laughs> own personal twist on a very serious event, particularly for political actors and and elites. So 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 this is something that... It's a, it's a gossip, <coughs> isn't it? It's a gossip. Yeah, uh, but then, we're, gossip. then we're back where we were 20 years ago, aren't we? Like the, as I understood, the, the concept of the CNN effect is that by events that are sudden, violent, dramatic, uh, they get attention. And that more long-term, um, serious events that are harder to, to put into one picture or one phrase uh, are ignored. So how doesn't then just the new media um, continues that trend, just with a, in a different way? But, in, in a sense, you could say, you know, if you're going to follow the kind of, sort of the logic of, of the argument I was making about my concerns about where we might be heading, is that you, you not only have the kind of superficial responses, 
you, you, you might have a situation where you just have no response because if you look at the speed with which these issues suddenly come to dominate and then the speed with which they're just gone I mean Coney we talked about the proposal is a good example of that and so on that you've got the speed and pace that you're not even getting sort of perhaps some superficial awkward unsatisfactory in the context of humanitarian crisis responses you might just be getting nothing at all because it's there one day and then it's gone the next and so on and I remember being at a talk with Nick Gowing was giving about sort of his point about this environment and so on, the speed of communication. And I think I've forgotten exactly the formulation he uses, but the idea of which, you know, you, know, you have 24 hours to get your point in from the point of view of government, and it's gone. And as, as many people pointed out in the NATO audience, was that, well, if, if it's gone that quickly, do we have to care about it anymore? Because it really is. These things don't build the capacity to really start to draw significant attention and so on. So. This, I think, was uh, the advantage of the traditional media has always been, uh, number one, that you present views from different perspectives and different actors. And today, you have, uh, especially in the new media, you have one source representing only one view. So you have to read like a few sources in order to get a bigger picture. <laughs> and sometimes it's so time consuming and so problematic is that you satisfy yourself with reading one source, then credibility becomes a major uh, criterion for selection. But then the question is how you select, and we then we go back to selective exposure. So in the past, the traditional media <clears throat> was able to give you a balanced picture of about the process or uh, or about about uh, especially about processes. Uh, the second, the second element is superficiality, and I think that this is exactly the problem. The, the faster you go, the more superficial you become. And um, I, I think it's interesting to see how long a story survives on on, on internet sources. Like you know, I've, I'm writing op-ed articles for the for the for the traditional media as well as for the new media. And sometimes I'm, I'm amazed. I'm writing what I consider to be a very good piece. Like, you don't have a space limit, right? In the, in the <clears throat> an op-ed article for the, for the print media is what? 400 words, 500 words? In <clears throat> the new media, I'm writing like 900, 1,000 word articles. And when I do the print media op-ed, I'm thinking for myself where I have to cut. Like I have an argument, I have to cut it to fit the space of the print media. Then for the new media, I don't have to consider that. I can write twice as many words. But I have found that the, the op-ed things I'm writing for the new media, yeah, they, they keep on in the front for five hours, six hours, or something like that. So this is the paradox. You have more space. You write more in-depth articles, but they disappear after a few hours. In the print media, you have much less space. You can't write long articles, but they stay at least, say, what, 24, 24 hours at least. And in my case, I found that you know, I'm, 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 they are being clipped and they are disseminated, and I see them, I see them, I see them disseminated. I don't see new media stuff being disseminated to all kinds of governments and agencies the same way the print media uh, articles or. So this is what I'm concerned about. And I think, you know, we're talking about journalists. Journalists have become, yeah, excuse me, become a little bit lazy. So instead of <laughs> investigating and asking questions, they look uh, at the new media and they summarize what they see because sometimes you know, for print media, uh, you, you see what's going on during the day before, and you summarize and you print. I think this is terrible. And I think, you know, students, students, students look at, they, they don't investigate as well. It's laziness. It's everything is, is you have a lot, of, a lot of information today. So it's easy. So you go, I'm forcing, I, I'm forcing my students to do investigative work. And sometimes I'm telling them, I don't want to see any source from, from the new media. No, it's not good either. But I think, you know, you have, to, you have to educate. You have to educate journalists. 
You have to educate the people who consume information. You have to educate. Uh, you have to educate uh, citizens uh, and, and, and and students. And I think that um, it will take a few years before we adjust ourselves to the challenges of the of the new media and how how to overcome.